All right, the origins, development, and purpose of this doctrine of purgatory. The idea of purgatory, a fictitious place of final purgation, was invented by Pope Gregory the Great in 593. There was such a reluctance to accept the idea, since it went contrary to Scripture, that purgatory did not become an official Catholic dogma for nearly 850 years. So, you know, all these dogmas have to go through the years. The Bible's always been around, and it reflects all the way back to Adam and Eve. It doesn't add stuff later that you should have been responsible for long after you live. So, nearly 850 years at the Council of Florence in 1439, it became official. <coughs> And before that, did anyone spend time in, uh, in purgatory? No. no. No doctrine has so increased the church's power over its members or added so much to its income. To this day, the threat of purgatory hangs over Catholics, who therefore give repeated offerings to the church for its help in getting them out of that place of torment. Rome promises that if its decrees are followed, one will eventually be released from purgatory and enter heaven. Yet, the church has never been able to define how long any person must spend in purgatory or how much that time is shortened by any means it offers. Wow, it took them hundreds of years to figure out it's official. And then, you know, how long are you going to be there? I don't know. <laughs> it is utter folly to trust one's release from purgatory to a church which cannot even define how long one must spend there for each sin or how much each ritual or act of penance reduces purgatorial suffering. Nevertheless, offerings are given by Catholics to the church and large sums left in wills, remember Henry VIII, to have multi multiple masses said on one's behalf. <clears throat> that process never stops just in case more masses are needed. The Council of Trent, Vatican II, and the resulting Code of Canon Law contain many complex rules for applying the merits of the living, especially masses, <clears throat> to the dead in purgation of their sins and to reduce them in purgatory. The church offers the paschal sacrifice for the dead so that the dead may be helped by prayers and the living may be consoled by hope. Among masses for the dead, it is whatever happened to the grace of God, among masses for the dead, it is the funeral mass which holds the first place in importance. A mass for the dead may be celebrated as soon as news of a death is received. Flannery, he wrote in that page 205, he wrote, A major developer of this horribly false but ingeniously profitable doctrine was an Augustinian monk named Augustino Trionfo. In his day, 14th century, the popes ruled as absolute monarchs over both heaven and earth. By their power to bind and loose, they had not only established and deposed kings and emperors, but it was believed they could open or shut the gates of heaven to mankind at will. Trionfo's genius extended this authority at the behest of Pope John XII to a rule third realm. Von Dollinger explains, It had been said before that the power of God's vicar and the Pope extended over two realms, the earthly and the heavenly. From the end of the 13th century, a third, where is God in this? From the end of the 13th century, a third realm was added, the empire rule, over which was assigned to the Pope by the theologians of the Curia Purgatory. Just, you know, it's amazing. You're Catholic and you really get informed on these doctrines and they turn around and they change them, reverse them, and make them worse. Problems with support from two Maccabees. Gavin tells how in this day, the early 18th century, it was still commonly taught that there were eight levels in Purgatory. The poor were in the lowest level, where the fire was coolest, with kings in the highest level, where the fire was hottest. God in his goodness and supposedly had supposedly planned it that way because kings and nobles were able to pay more to the church to get their souls out where the poor had little to pay. So, the poor and the lowest level didn't have much money to pay so they could charge less. Nobles were able to pay more to the church to get their souls out whereas the poor had little to pay. He tells of poor people who upon being told that a relative who had just died was among the beggars in purgatory, scraped together the money to say enough masses to get them moved up to a higher level. Wow. I wonder what political party these guys belong to. Though the torment was greater, they would be in better company. So, wow. So the priests charged money both to make the torment 
in purgatory greater and to get poor souls out of it. Lesser. So the priest charged money to, both to make the torment in purgatory lesser. He wrote this article. And I'll put it in brackets. That doesn't make any sense. Neither the word purgatory itself nor the idea of purgatory is to be found even once in the entire Bible. <clears throat> nor is it much as hinted by, at by Jesus or the apostles. Apologist Carl Keating admits that the doctrine is not explicitly set out in the Bible. That's an understatement. Well, he's a Catholic. Carl Keating, Catholicism and Fundamentalism. The Attack on Romanism by Bible Christians. The one verse always cited in support of purgatory comes from the Apocrypha. It is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. 2 Maccabees 12, 46. There are three obvious problems with this verse. First of all, there is not one example in the entire Bible of anyone praying for the dead. The Mormons do that too all the time, a lot. The Bible clearly states that it is appointed unto men once to die, Hebrews 9.27, but after this, the judgment. No point in praying after that. The judgment is, God's judgment is final. It is too late for prayer after death. All that follows is judgment. Thereafter, therefore, this verse in the Apocrypha contradicts the Bible. Which will you go with? <clears throat> Secondly, those of whom this was said had been guilty of idolatry, but under the tunic of each of the dead they found amulets sacred to the idols of Jam Jamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. 2 Mac Maccabees 12.40 Idolatry was a mortal sin, and, according to Catholic doctrine, would have landed these men, in not in purgatory, but in hell, from which there is no release. Thus, the idea of praying for them was both blasphemous and a waste of time, hardly the basis for accepting the doctrine of purgatory. Finally, the book, the very book of Maccabees itself declares that there were no prophets at this time, and thus the inspiration of God had ceased. There had not been such great distress in Israel since the time prophets ceased to appear among the people, 1 Maccabees 9.27. And again, the Jewish people and their priests have, therefore, made the following decisions. Simon shall be their permanent leader and high priest until a new prophet arises. 1 Maccabees 14.41 Thus, the two books of Maccabees can only be regarded as historical accounts at best, but certainly not as scripture. I don't underline that. Well, yeah. You go to the Apocrypha, you better find some things that are apocryphal. <laughs> Inasmuch as God was not inspiring anyone among his people. Obviously then, one cannot support any true doctrine by a quote from this source. No one no wonder it contradicts the Bible. What about Paul's suffering? Catholic apologists attempt to be biblical by basing the doctrine of purifying sufferings from on Colossians 1.24 where Paul says, who now, now, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church? That Paul's suffering, however, had nothing to do with purging sin, either his own or anyone else's. It is clear from the fact that Christ's sufferings had completed that work. Only a sinless sacrifice and the shedding of blood would avail. So we ask, then what did Paul mean by his statement? Rather than suffering to effect the purification of his, or any, anyone else's soul, Paul was suffering for the sake of bringing the gospel to others. My suffering for you. Context, context, context. He referred to the persecution which all that will live godly in Christ Jesus would suffer. 2 Timothy 3.12 Jesus told his disciples they would be hated and persecuted by the world. There is an offense of the cross. And Paul said we must be willing to suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. I got a hint of that in my life. It is not that Paul, like Christ, was suffering for sins in order to make up for what Christ's suffering upon the cross lacked. For there has, was no lack in that. There was suffering that Paul endured, and all other Christians true to the Lord must endure, comes from because 
We identify ourselves with Christ and live Christ-like lives that condemn the world and reveal its evil. <clears throat> Therefore, the world hates us as they hated Christ. In fact, Christ said that Paul must suffer greatly for my name's sake. In Acts 5.41, the disciples rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The suffering that true Christians endure is at the hands of those who hate their, their Lord and are offended by his cross. Sometimes I wonder some of the things that I face, minor compared to what other people face as Christians, but sometimes I think it's just a natural part of growing older. But if you take it on the chin and move through it, live up to your obligations no matter how difficult it is day by day, you just do your goals for the sake of the Lord's ministry that he has for you. Philippians 1.29 says it is a privilege to suffer because of the hatred the world has toward Christ. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ <clears throat> not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Second Thess 1.5 speaks of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. 1 Timothy 4.10 said that we labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God. Peter also referred to the suffering that comes to every Christian who is true to the Lord, 1 Peter 3.14, 4.13.16. Many other verses express the same thought. Doing the right thing, the Christian thing, is not always rewardable by good times, but by difficulties that people throw in your face. In Philippians 3.10, Paul expresses his passion to know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings, which he says helps to bring him into conformity with the death and character of Christ. It is clear that Paul suffered to refer to sufferings for Christ's sake here upon the earth at the hands of sinners, not to suffering in a future purgatory to be cleansed of one's sins. Paul writes in Romans 8.18 8, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Certainly there is no thought of purgatory. We go from the sufferings of this world into the presence and glory of Christ and God. I've had these thoughts a lot lately because I'm getting older. I said I, I count myself looking at myself like I have two people. Because I think of myself, I'm going through this. This is me. This is my personality. This is my 80-year-old personality. There's nobody else looking at, or I have a, a hope for the future. I'm in the present moment more often than not, unless, and I should be, in the hope of future eternity, skipping over these terrible uh, growing old lives, watching the civilization of the earth deteriorate more and more and more, and more things are declared good which are evil, over and over and over again. The complete disassociation of, of actually goodwill towards one another and respect. I say, can this, can this be a movie I'm watching, or am I really living in this in my real life? But I look forward then, move forward to eternity. How I get my eternal view? Doing what I'm doing now. Going over these ideas of purgatory. Going and reading through 1 Corinthians chapter 7 now. And I'm realizing, Paul says, the station that God placed you in. Live it. Don't regret it. Live it to the glory of God, to the best of your capacity, because that's where you're functional. That's where God placed you. Nevertheless, Paul said to, about slaves, accept your condition of slavery, but if God gives you the opportunity to move forward and out of it, do so. Other serious problems with purgatory. The doctrine of purgatory errors in a number of other ways. It forgets that we are offered God's infinite justice. James says that even the smallest sin makes a sinner guilty of breaking all of the commandments. Why? Because any sin is rebellion against God, which separates the sinner from God for eternity. We are finite beings and could never pay the infinite penalty demanded by God's justice. Consequently, there is no escape from hell. But the sinner must suffer there eternally. To expiate one's sins by sufferings is therefore impossible. Of course... In theory, God could pay the infinite penalty demanded by his justice against sin, but that wouldn't be just because he isn't one of us. So God became man and through the virgin birth, being a sinless man, an infinite God in one person. Christ was able to satisfy the claims of his own justice 
so that whosoever believeth in him should never perish, not perish, but have everlasting life. John 